good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to this, um, this lecture with uh, Professor Case uh, Kunle on Schengen impl implementation and European migration law. My name is uh, Peter Burgess. I'm a research professor at the International Peace Research Institute in Oslo and also a um, senior research uh, fellow at the Institute for European Studies right across the street. So it wasn't such a short trip as you might uh, guess. This is the first uh, lecture in a semester-long lecture series entitled Europe under threat, with a question mark, Europe under threat, security, migration, and uh, integration. The series is organized by three institutions. One is, uh, of course, the Institute for European Studies of the day today. The other is the International Peace Research Institute in Oslo, TRIO, as it's called. And thirdly, the Center for Law, Science, Technology, and Society, Society Studies, also here at the DUP. And there, uh, our good colleague uh, Serge Gutbert could not be here tonight, but sends his apologies. You'll be meeting him if you join us next week uh, at the next uh, session. Um, the series uh, covers a range of topics, relative, all relative to the challenge of understanding and dealing with the question of security and migration, the relationship between these two concepts and the realities to which they uh, refer. Among the topics, European and international law, uh, policing, criminality, border control, security technologies, and they're linked to border control systems, human rights, religion, uh, culture, ethnic diversity, citizenship, immigration policy, and not the least, biopolitics. All of this for the same money in one semester series. Um, the series is uh, intentionally built up with uh, both academics and policymakers, so that we can essentially uh, get both sides uh, of the story. It takes place, as you might have noticed, every Wednesday at this time for 12 sessions, and we hop over Armistice Day for obvious uh, reasons, which falls on Wednesday this year. Um, with the exception of today, where well, we have a kind of keynote uh, address by Professor Frunendek, um, we'll have two speakers, two lecturers, each giving a, a short uh, presentation and then having lots of room for discussion, questions, comments, debates, protests, uh, as you uh, might like. And then each session will be hosted by either myself or uh, my colleague, Serge Gutzet. Um, the complete program is available on the webpage. If you haven't seen it already, you're probably registered, so you've been there, but it's uh, ies.be. And all of this would be impossible, I have to say publicly, uh, without the organizational genius of my good colleague, Marc de Klerk, who's the events uh, uh, organizer at, of the Institute for European Studies. Now I want to spend a few minutes so, talking about the argument, the principles of the lecture series, before I pass the, the floor on to Professor Um uh, Beginning with the concept of security and its strange relationship to the concept of uh, migration. Of course, as you all know, the concept of security is traditionally uh, a concept of uh, sovereignty, of uh, denoting the status of sovereign states in a closed international system, traditionally speaking. And in this system, supposedly, the state is uh, assumed to be both the object of security, the one that needs security, needs securing, securitizing, if you like, and at the same time, strangely enough, maybe not so strangely, but it seems almost strange now, the primary provider uh, of security. So it's on both ends of the equation, receiving security and providing security. So threats to the state security, in a sense, are understood as threats to the autonomy, the political autonomy, if you like, of the state system. The major international institutions that emerged after the Second World War were built around uh, this idea. And of course, this is a fundamental pillar in the United Nations uh, uh, Charter. So when the founders of the United Nations spoke of collective security, they weren't talking about small-scale uh, groups. They were referring to state security and to the coordinated system that would be necessary to, in, in order to avoid international war of the kind we saw in the period leading up to the formation of the United Nations. But today, it's almost a caricature. Today, we seem to be faced by a really, a really quite entirely different uh, landscape of security threats, both real, uh, politicized, fantasized, and ideologized, if you like, if you forgive me the, the, the term. Um, some new, some traditional. We have um, 
new forms of nationalism, ethnic conflict, civil war. We have infor information technology a conflict, a conflict across uh, certain uh, borders. We have biological threats, chemical threats, resource conflicts, pandemics, uh, mass migrations, which of course we're talking in particular about here, transnational terrorism, uh, environmental dangers. And these all challenge, according to many, some uh, believe it more than uh, others, the limits of our ability to safeguard European society, the values which uh, we believe uh, make up European society, if we assume, if we accept that uh, assumption. And I say this because I think in this series we're going to be critical to this idea. We're going to question it and interrogate it. So the, the growing awareness or the perception of these new threats has brought about a change in the way we understand what security is. Long gone is this, not entirely disappeared, but long far away is this state-centric security uh, issue. And consequently, the security landscape, the picture of security, needs to be revised and uh, critiqued. And that's very much the purpose of this exercise. Uh, first of all, attention needs to be drawn to the complex and composite nature of state security. It's no longer unified and, and autonomous. It's, com it's complex, it's, it's composite, it's made up of different sub-elements, all of which complicate the assumption that the state can be un understood as a simple object of security in the good old-fashioned uh, political theoretical uh, conception. Secondly, the importance of non-state objects of security needs to be better understood, better conceptualized. Um, in other words, security that is related uh, to state security indeed, but not identical to it. That's all, both larger than state security and smaller than it. Um, uh, and such objects of security can divide and be divided into a number of different categories. On the one hand, in any case, you have individuals, in the sense that human security talks about individuals. And you have sub-state groups as well, cultural, ethnic groups, political groups, uh, regional groups, local groups, etc. And then on the other end, you have trans-state uh, entities, transnational issues, and these can also be ethnic and, and cultural and linguistic. Now, across the, the wide horizon of this new picture of security, we can note two distinct features which will be very important for what we have to say about migration. The one is that these kinds of threats, the way they're perceived in any case, they, they surpass boundaries. They're trans-boundary. They don't respect boundaries in the same way. When we talk about pandemics, when we talk about climate change, these are obviously not the territorial issues that, that uh, feed into the territorial uh, notion of the state. And at the same time, and in the same vein, they're interconnected, the, the, the threats that we're talking about, through processes of globalization and other process, processes. No one state, by consequence, can manage these kinds of security threats uh, alone. Uh, nor can any one state manage the threats, security threats to its neighbors or, or, or to its region. There's sort of an ultra-state uh, toolkit which is necessary, necessary in order to approach this kind of picture. So in the globalized setting, the challenge of maintaining security is no longer limited to the institutions which in the 1940s were made to do this. Since at least the mid-1990s, security and insecurity are no longer considered uh, as conditioned solely by geopolitics and by military strength. But they're conditioned and determined, co-determined, if you like, by social, economic, environmental, moral, and even cultural, even cultural issues. Since uh, September 11th, the attacks of September 11th, 2001, migration then has uh, become an intense object for security uh, analysis. The international balance of peoples and their movement is now under intense scrutiny both in Europe and abroad, in the United States in particular, and uh, has led to the deployment of new technologies of surveillance of individuals and new legal paradigms for the juridical control of populations. But uh, well before the attacks of New York, Washington, and then of course London and Madrid in Europe, the issue of migration of the economic, social, and of the economic, social, and cultural consequences of the movement of peoples 
was already uh, to some degree existed, even though it's become intensified now. Moreover, this sense of threat and insecurity that we're referring to here is not restricted to popular experiences of migration. It also leaves a mark on research and policy, and that's part of what we're addressing in this lecture series. The association of migration with security has put an ideological stop or break to adequate critical scrutiny of policy formation and practice, even while it represents the uh, uh, disregard for uh, certain forms of certain understandings uh, and prejudices about European uh, unity and cultural homogeneity. So what we want to do here also is provide a critical toolkit for looking at the way that perceptions of uh, migration-based security get transformed on the one hand into scholarly, scholarly research and on the other hand uh, into uh, policy formation. In Europe today, immigration uh, from developing regions in the world is widely experienced as a threat. We can see this not uh, uh, in many places, but not least in the European Union's uh, security research program, which is uh, pouring wide and vigorous resources into the protection of the European external border from the threat of uh, migration. So there's a feeling of insecurity, whether it's based on a proper assessment or, or, uh, or ration, rational analysis or not. There's a feeling of insecurity which translates into very, very powerful political uh, consequences. We are often about the way in which migration has a negative impact on the security of host societies, how it can introduce economic competition, undermine job security for nationals, how it can be associated with particular health risks, how it can even have implications for security involving criminal activities, how it can affect national identity, and how it can be associated with xenophobia and uh, discrimination. But for better or worse, uh, uh, there are other kinds of security challenges, not so much home focused, which concern migration in a variety of ways. Here are three. First, one form or another of security motivates the movement of migrants, pressing them and, and, and encouraging them to either internal displacement or sometimes risky, sometimes very risky trips uh, abroad. So the correlation between the conditions of economic health, food, and military insecurity uh, in the developing world can be directly cor uh, correlated with patterns of migration on regional and local scale. Secondly, and obviously we see from the news uh, pictures from, uh, quite commonly, people are face insecurity when they're on the move. This is particularly the case for irregular, undocumented migrants. Greater risks are being taken by people trying to move illegally from poor to richer parts of the world. For example, crossing the Mexico-United States border or the Mediterranean from North Africa to South Southern Europe. A specific category of irregular migrants for whom this is often the case includes uh, the victims of migrant smugglers and human traffickers. Mm. Thirdly, certain migrants are also insecure in their destination countries, the place where they end up. This is particularly the case, again, of irregular migrants who work illegally and are often subject to exploitation. Their jobs are often dirty and dangerous and difficult, Exactly those jobs, of course, we see it every day, that nationals are unwilling to take. The victims of human trafficking, an important migrant group, are not free to decide on the activities in which they engage. They're often forced to these low-paid, insecure, and degrading work that we, uh, that we find uh, it impossible, and they find it impossible to escape uh, from these, uh, and for which they receive trivial or little uh, compensation. For these reasons, and here I conclude, a wide-ranging revision and broadening of the notion of security is a, an essential presupposition for understanding the relationship between security, migration, and integration. So the purpose of this lecture series and the volume that we're planning that we should follow it is to undertake just that revision through a mapping, a careful mapping and analysis of the link between migration, integration, and the security issues.
their friend. Who better than could we uh, invite uh, to hold the keynote address in this context than uh, Professor Keith Kulundek, who is Professor of Soci the Sociology of Law and Chairman of the Center for Migration Law at Radboud Universität Nijmegen. He's also, uh, not incidentally, Chairman of the Mayerus Committee, the Standing Committee of the Experts on Inter International Immigration, Refugee and Criminal Law. Throughout an extensive and very, very productive uh, career, he has published widely on topics such as social and legal status of immigrants, immigration and race relations, legislation and policies, and legal profession and uh, legal aid. He will speak on the topic of Schengen implementation and European immigration law. Uh, after the talk, he'll talk about 35 or 40 minutes, and after the talk, there'll be plenty of room for uh, questions or just uh, comments or other uh, discussion. So it's, I'm happy to give the floor to you, Professor. Thank you, Peter, for your kind words and for the invitation to speak here as the first. So I still have a blank, uh, I would say a blank audience, but uh, at least the first one in the, in the uh, series I can duplicate others. Uh, Europe, over the last century, has gradually become an area of immigration. And the EU will remain an immigration region if only for demographic and geographic reasons. The reducing population uh, will create the need for workers and not only for high qualified workers as we are often uh, tend to believe, uh, especially after the politicians keep on talking about the Lisbon program. Several EU member states long wear and perceive themselves as countries of immigration. France may be the only uh, exception to these rules. But in the other member states, the number of persons leaving the country clearly exceeded the number of immigrants for many, many years in the 20th century. In the Netherlands, my home country, uh, it changed uh, in, 19, in the mid-1960s. From uh, a country of immigration, we became a country of immigration. And in the southern member states, Greece, Italy, Portugal and Spain, uh, they became only countries of immigration uh, about 20 years ago. And in Ireland, the change occurred only 10 years ago, less than 10 years ago. And actually, in the new member states in Central Europe, uh, they are experiencing a, a, a growing immigration from third countries, from outside the EU. According to Eurostat data, in 2004, only Poland and the two Baltic states and the Netherlands had a net immigration, so more people leaving the country than uh, entering. In Poland and Lithuania and Latvia, the large-scale immigration was the clear effect uh, of the free movement after their accession to the EU. And in the Netherlands, the sudden change in political climate and the government's policies, both being openly unfriendly to immigrants, induced immigrants to vote with their feet. The immigration surplus in the Netherlands in 2007 was the largest in the EU, the immigration surplus. Now, when we are thinking uh, about how countries should deal with immigrants and how they have dealt with immigrants uh, in Europe, it, it might be useful to uh, look outside Europe. Uh, and I would uh, invite you to use the terms introduced by uh, an important uh, American immigration scholar, Hiroshio Motomori, in his recent book, Americans in Waiting. distinguishes uh, between uh, two models, you could say two ways of thinking, uh, or if you want, ideologies, uh, 
visible in US immigration law. And he terms them the contract model and the future, future citizen model. In the contract model, uh, immigration and immigration law is based on the idea that there is a kind of contract between the immigrant uh, coming from abroad uh, who is admitted under certain terms and if he doesn't live up to the terms he will, can be compelled to leave the country and this country, the, this contract is for a certain uh, period of time so at the end of the contract, the contract is over and the immigrant goes back it's a in, in, in typical kind of contract because it can be unilaterally changed. The terms can be unilaterally changed by the government by changing the immigration rules. The, uh, the terms of the contract changes, and he opposes this to the other model, the uh, which uh, lays the back of the part of the U.S. Uh, immigration law, what that, that he terms as the future citizen model, where an immigrant is admitted on the presupposition that he will stay and that he will become a citizen. He will become a citizen of full rights and that there is a kind of uh, probationary, probationary period and if he behaves during that probationary uh, uh, period and passes a test uh, at the end of uh, the period he becomes a full citizen. Now the two points I want to make uh, in my introduction tonight uh, are related to this and the first point is that the Schengen Cooperation unintendedly has resulted in a clear move in European migration law from the contract model to the future citizen model. So move from the contract model to the future citizen model. And my second point is that the link, the link between migration law and policy, uh, police and, and criminal law cooperation, link between migration and security, is less self-evident or logic than is often presented uh, and that it may be even detrimental for the immigration of immigrants uh, in uh, the member states. So the, the uh, link between immigration and uh, security uh, in policy might counteract to a certain extent the, the move towards the future citizens model. Now, to illustrate your points, I first want to uh, look with you a bit at the history of Schengen. Schengen started as an internal market economic affair. It had nothing to do with, in the beginning with security. Basically, it was a reaction to a large uh, demonstration by truck drivers uh, in international transport blocking in 1983 the borders between Germany and France, between France and Spain, between France and Belgium. Uh, blo blocking them for such a long time that it caused a lot of problem and the, the demonstration was uh, to react, to oppose uh, the, the long formalities, the long delays at, uh, at those borders that they or their employers considered to be contrary to their idea of, uh, of Europe. And in a reaction to this uh, demonstration, uh, the governments of France and Germany uh, decided to, to sign the Treaty of saint Lucan in 1984, uh, a treaty that intended to abolish, reduce and then abolish border controls uh, between uh, Germany and, and France. And uh, there's a story that uh, uh, Chancellor Kohl was then in power in, in, in Germany, took a very personal interest in uh, the, uh, uh, the signing of this treaty and he later on uh, supported the whole development of Schengen personally a lot. The story is that uh, being a secondary school child at the end of the Second World War, uh, as a student in Freiburg, he once with a group of friends went to uh, the, the French-German border uh, near the Rhine and with uh, a group of friends, lifted the red and white barrier and to show, I mean, there shouldn't be any border uh, between the two countries. Uh, and of course, that has symbolically been a very important border in, in Europe in the, in the 20th uh, century. Uh, 
So uh, this was the opportunity for him to realize uh, something of his aim of his student time. And I think we often uh, underestimate the importance of persons in what is happening in, in those politics. We, we talk about institutions and organizations, but persons play an important role. Now, what happened when this treaty was signed? In the Netherlands, there was a fear that uh, this would create a competitive disadvantage for the, German, for the German and the French transport organizations. The Netherlands had a very uh, large, relatively very large road transportation sector, and they thought this would be a negative uh, competitive disadvantage. So what they did, the Netherlands, they mobilized the, the Benelux partners to join this uh, uh, cooperation and to join this idea to do away with border, with, with border controls. Uh, and that's how uh, the uh, uh, Schengen uh, Agreement uh, came into uh, force uh, one year later, the first uh, Schengen Agreement. And in the Netherlands, the first six years, Schengen affairs were, were coordinated from the Ministry of Economic Affairs, not from Justice, not from in the Internal Affairs. This was seen basically as an economic uh, uh, institution. One of the interesting things, of course, of Schengen was that it was an intergovernmental cooperation uh, outside the EC. Uh, and, of course, why was it outside the EC? Because the member states uh, wanted to avoid interference by communist institutions like the Commission, the Court, uh, and, and the Parliament. Originally, Schengen was thought as a simple, practical agreement between administrations. So there was no need to sign uh, and ratify by national parliaments. This was just a coordination of administration, five administrations. And uh, I remember myself when I read for the first time in, in 85 the, the Schengen uh, agreement that I had a kind of déjà vu uh, feeling because together with a colleague, for many years I had been uh, active in the Netherlands to get the Benelux rules on, on uh, migration published. I mean, they were secret. Nobody knew. You could have written. We have been busy to extend the competence of the Benelux court towards interpreting those Benelux rules. Uh, and finally we succeeded. And there are two interesting judgments uh, that are still worth reading. I mean, they are published in Dutch and French, so you, can, you might be able to, to, to read them. Uh, uh, of the Netherlands court on, on, on migration uh, uh, matters. And what happened, of course, what the, the government did, is exactly the same. Again, an intergovernmental uh, cooperation, so we can start all over again, was our feeling. And interestingly, if uh, the, uh, the Irish population votes the right way uh, on the 2nd of October, and the German President signs, uh, a ratify, signs the ratification acts for the Lisbon of Treaty, 25 years after Schengen, there is the full uh, reintegration of immigration matters in, in, uh, in the community. Full uh, powers of the, the Commission, of, of the Parliament, and uh, of, the, uh, Europe, uh, of the European Court of Justice. Uh, so, uh, it takes sometimes time, but uh, it's worth the, uh, worth the effort. What did the Schengen Corporation bring uh, in the field of immigration? And now I don't look from the perspective of, of the government, but I look from the perspective of, the, of immigrants, of third country nationals. Uh, there were some clear advantages in the Schengen Corporation. And I think maybe the most important uh, uh, advantage from the perspective of integration was the abolishment of the controls at the internal borders. I still remember my uh, uh, Dutch friend of Suriname origin that each year he went with his family on summer holidays to Italy uh, because that was their popular, uh, popular destination and he said always the trip to and from Italy were a horror. At each border we were stopped because we were all black and we had to get out of the car, and the car was checked, and so the, the holidays were perfect, but the trip was a terrible experience of racial discrimination at each border. That was abolished. The second thing that was abolished by the introduction of the, the right uh, to circulate, the right to travel for three uh, 
months for those who had residence permits in one of the Schengen state or had a Schengen visa. What it did abolish was the long queues uh, in the Netherlands in front of the French and the German consulates of Moroccan and Turkish workers who went home each uh, summer holiday. If they went home as holiday, summer holiday, they had to have uh, visas for all the countries in, uh, uh, in between. Luckily at that time, Spain did, 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 did still exempted uh, uh, Moroccan citizens from a visa obligation, so the, the ones in uh, uh, Moroccan works in the Netherlands could use the Benelux, the free movement in the Benelux, and they had to have a visa for France, and then they could travel uh, again visa free through, uh, to, through uh, Spain. The Turkish workers were less uh, successful, less happy in that, uh, in that way. So these were two clear advantages, no internal controls, no the ever repeating experience of racial discrimination at the border. Uh, and uh, the possibility to travel through and visit other member states. Now there were also clear disadvantages from their perspective. Uh, first, it was re re replacement of controls at the internal borders by more thorough controls at the outside borders. And additionally, more internal controls uh, inside the countries and outside the EU. Uh, as a uh, compensatory measure for the abolishment of, internal, of the controls at the internal borders. There were new controls in many countries, for instance in the Netherlands, there were not, not a tradition of having controls on immigrants inside the country uh, that was introduced. And there were a range of new controls at the visa offices, at the airports, the carrier sanctions, all kinds of controls outside, uh, uh, outside the East in the EU. Interestingly, by the way, is that the uh, temporary, temporary reintroduction of controls at the internal borders were focused mainly on EU citizens, not on third country nationals. When those controls were reintroduced, or when they were now and then introduced behind the borders, which of course was not allowed under the same rules, but Many, many member of the Schengen states did so, they were focused on EU nationals, on anti-globalization demonstrators, on football hooligans for the European Championship or other big matches, or uh, petty drug uh, peddlers. So, not against third internationals, the re reintroduction of the controls, but against the EU nationals. Uh, the second clear disadvantage for uh, uh, third country nationals uh, was the Schengen Information System. Once you were registered in the Schengen Information uh, System, you were in practice buried from the whole Union. Uh, so the price for uh, staying illegal and for being detected uh, and expelled uh, for illegal uh, stay became uh, much higher. Uh, and uh, another problem was that, that uh, the a registration or in the Schengen in, in, in information system uh, was in, in many cases uh, not correct. For instance, Germany illegally uh, introduced a large part of its refused asylum seekers in the Schengen, Schengen uh, information system, which was not allowed under the, the, the Schengen uh, implementing uh, uh, agreement. But the persons uh, uh, perceived those effects. Uh, the effects of that registration uh, at the external uh, borders of the Union or in the visa offices uh, abroad. And the, the third negative effect was the, the clear link uh, between immigration control, making immigration rules, and securities uh, affairs, police and, and criminal justice cooperation in one legal document, and also later on in one bureaucracy within the EU. Uh, where you had a DG, uh, G, uh, GLS, Justice, uh, Liberty and Security, uh, which incorporated both uh, approaches to, uh, to uh, 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 immigrants and, and, and had a clear different uh, ideology than the DG Social Affairs that so far had dealt with free movements uh, of uh, workers and free movement of union citizens. 
Now, earlier examples of abolishment of controls at the internal borders in Europe, uh, within the Nordic Union, within the Benelux, uh, the joint travel area uh, between the UK and Ireland, were never accompanied by similar sets of detailed rules and forms of cooperation in, in uh, uh, police and, and criminal justice uh, affairs. Neither had there been uh, common rules on admission of third internationals in those, uh, as, an, as a result of uh, those uh, forms of abolishment of controls at the internal borders. So the, the so-called uh, accompanying uh, compensatory measures were not so natural, so self-evident or uh, necessary as they were often presented by uh, polit politicians and, I should say, uh, accepted uh, and re uh, reproduced by academics who copied the jargon in policy documents. I mean, they were the result of clear choices to do it different uh, uh, this way. Now, why was Schengen uh, start, that started as an intergovernmental uh, uh, cooperation uh, incorporated in the EC uh, and in the EU uh, with the Treaty of uh, Amsterdam in 1997? Uh, was, uh, with that treaty was a special protocol that, uh, for practical purposes, said that all intergovernmental rules agreed and the, the Schengen Corporation became uh, community law and at the same time part of the intergovernmental cooperation uh, instituted under the Maastricht Treaty in, in 1992 uh, also uh, was uh, introduced in the first pillar, so far part of the third pillar was introduced in, in the uh, uh, in the first pillar. Now, why did the governments agree to end their intergovernmental cooperation and make a community cooperation out of it? And I think there are basically two reasons. First reason is the lack of legitimacy. There was persistent criticism in the press, in the national parliaments uh, of the member states by NGOs, on the secrecy of the secret law making, Schengen rules not being published. I remember a telephone call by a German colleague who said, I want to write about Schengen laws. Uh, I uh, have gotten uh, from a friend in the ministry, uh, the Bundesinnen Ministerium, the, the text, but I can't refer to them, and I know that they have been published in the Netherlands, so can you give me a reference of the Dutch law so that I can use it in an article? Uh, now, he, he, he made the effort to see the rules, and he had a friend, so he got the rules, but, but the rules were not published. Uh, and there was a very limited role for parliamentary roles. Now, this undermined the legitimacy of the whole intergovernmental cooperation, but I think even more important than the lack of legitimacy was the lack of efficiency. First, there was no effective way to solve problems. And one of the uh, uh, and solve conflicts between member states, and I think one of the, the main conflicts that that immobilized Schengen in its, its last years in the, in the mid 1990s was the, con the persistent conflict between the Netherlands uh, and France, especially President Chirac, on the drug the Dutch liberal Dutch drug drug policy, and and this being used as an argument to continue. Uh, controls at the uh, internal uh, internal borders. There was no other way than <coughs> diplomacy, and diplomacy didn't work in this ideolo ideological conflict. So the the whole machinery of Schengen more or less came came to a halt. There was no way to guarantee that the member states, the Schengen states, lived up to their obligations. It was no only then diplomatic uh, contacts or negotiations between civil servants. There was no effective way of, of making uh, states live up to their obligations. Uh, then thirdly, uh, there was the rapidly expanding number of members. So it made the whole, uh, uh, Schengen started with five uh, uh, member states, then four uh, southern European uh, member states added, then Austria, Denmark and the other Nordic uh, uh, states. Uh, and the, the Benelux Secretariat that acted as the Secretariat for uh, uh, Schengen was unable to deal, uh, uh, to deal with it. Uh, and then finally, the speed, the slow speed of decision making. Uh, 
the Schengen Implementing Agreement of 1990, it, it, it took five years for it to be ratified by all uh, 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 member states. Uh, the same example, the, the Dublin Convention on the Responsibility for Asylum Request was adopted in 1990 and it was uh, ratified by the 12 member states only seven years later. Now this was, with this speed, uh, it is not possible to react to urgent uh, uh, problems. Efficiency and speed were the main reasons why the five member states in 1985 uh, had chosen to have the intergovernmental cooperation outside the EC framework as a cooperation by, between administrations. Uh, but in the end it turned against the cooperation and the, the states were forced to, uh, 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 forced to uh, incorporate Schengen in the EC. One indication was that uh, in 1986 there was no other member states in Germany, uh, Schengen state other than Germany who wanted to take the presidency of Schengen. No other state wanted to be responsible for the whole machinery uh, uh, anymore. So, democracy with its checks and balances is not only politically uh, a more attractive system, it is a more efficient system in the long run as well, although that this is often denied. Now, we are when the Amsterdam uh, Treaty uh, was uh, entered into force in 1999, uh, there was a, a, a change of the legal setting. Schengen and intergovernmental cooperation and the third pillar uh, were more or less merged, uh, and there were uh, rule-making powers in this area for the, for the Council of Ministers. Now we are today, we are 10 years later, uh, and I think it's good to uh, a good moment to have a kind of stock taking. What has happened? And I think uh, we can characterize the the, the, e, the present EC uh, migration law as basically consisting of two parts. First is the part on uh, with the rules on the free movement of EU nationals uh, and uh, their family members that has been recodified uh, in uh, the Directive 2004-35, the, the uh, Union's Citizens Directive, that applies to about 8 million EU nationals living in other member states. That's about 30% of all the migrants in, in Europe. Uh, and those rules basically have not changed since 1961, since the first regulation number 15, and they are clearly based on the future citizen law. Not that the Union has any competence uh, in the area of uh, naturalization and granting and withdrawing nationality, but the implicit model of integration and the perception of EU, EU migrants was that if you grant migrants, and based in the beginning this was basically migrant workers, equal treatment, access to employment to education, secure residence rights and right to family reunification, this would help assist in their integration in the host member state. And one of the interesting things is that in the latter uh, years, in the later years, you, you, in recent years, you see a lot of policy documents uh, in, in, in Brussels where there is talk about comparing national integration policies, looking for best practices, uh, advocating best practice, and often the authors of those reports, in my view, uh, forget that we have already, since 1961, a model, which I think is a best practice, uh, has worked for the integration of millions of EU migrants uh, uh, in, 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 in the Union, uh, but which is never included uh, in those uh, uh, documents, or, or, and, and very seldom referred to. Why would that, that model of uh, integration not work for the integration of third country national immigrants as well? So one set of rules, the free movement rules, working for about 30% of the migrants in Europe, and then there is a second set of rules, far more complicated because it's uh, uh, codified in more than 20 
directives and regulations based on the Articles 62 and 63 that were inserted in the EC Treaty uh, with the Amsterdam Treaty that co covered nowadays almost all areas of immigration law. You have the five asylum directives, the Family Reunification Directive, the Long-Term Residence Directive, the Students <coughs> Directive, the 2006 Schengen Border Code, which is it is named Schengen Border Code, but it is an EC regulation. The 2008 Returns Directive and the 2009 Visa Code, a regulation that will enter into force April uh, next year. Now, together, those instruments cover all areas of migration law except admission for employment. There has recently been adopted the blue uh, card proposal, which, if you read it carefully, uh, forces no member state to uh, uh, admit even one single highly skilled migrant. So it gives a whole set of rules, but no uh, uh, obligation for member state to for any member state to admit a single uh, person. So the area of admission for employment still is. Uh, excluded, but all the other areas of migration law are covered by a community law documents. And together, these instruments uh, determine the position of the 18.5 million registered third country nationals living in the EU. So the other 70% of the migrants, their legal position is governed by those complex uh, set of patchwork of new rules. And I think it is rather astonishing that member states in less than 10 years gave up a large part of their sovereignty in an area that is usually considered to be a central state function, area of controlling immigration. Now, why did this happen? And I want to propose uh, three reasons. And the first reason is that it became clear to politicians and to the wider population that policy area policy measures on a national level in one member state or practical implementation of national rules in one member state had effect in other member states to mention a few examples today in portugal the largest community of third country nationals are ukrainian nationals now, why Ukrainian nationals in Portugal? The answer is because a few years ago there was a very liberal policy of granting Schengen visa by the, the German consulate in Kiev. So, and the people with this German Schengen visa didn't travel to the Ukraine. They didn't travel to uh, Germany, but they traveled to Portugal. Other example: uh, in 1992, Germany decided to uh, have uh, introduced a restrictive asylum uh, uh, policy. Uh, the immediate effect was that in the next year, if you look at the migration statistics of all the neighboring countries, the uh, uh, number of asylum seekers uh, increased considerably. A third example. The Italian nationality law uh, allows in a rather liberal way uh, for descendants of Italian immigrants living over, uh, abroad or already for generations to recover or retain their Italian nationality. Now, in South Americans, there are a lot of descendants of Italian immigrants living, uh, and they are, on a large scale, uh, recovering their Italian nationality, not to travel to Italy, but to travel to, to, uh, uh, to Britain and to be employed in uh, uh, all kinds of jobs in, in Italy. So, it is clear that, uh, the, uh, that there are effects, often are the effects are real, Sometimes they are perceived. The whole discussion about the Italy and Spain never, uh, that they should never have a regularization again uh, without the approval of the other member states uh, because those regularized uh, third country nationals will move immediately up north, which I think in practice never happens. And if, if it's in Morocco and you have learned and managed to live in, in, in Spain for many, many years, you're not going to travel to Denmark where you don't speak the language other than to the Netherlands. Uh, but they dominated the debate. The, the idea that the, the 
acts in one member state and practice in one member state uh, 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 have effects in, in the uh, other member states and the hope that there can be effective migration control if you have common action. And I think this hope is only very partially fulfilled at the national level and, and, and I think it will always have the same partial reality on the European level. So that's the first reason. And I think the second reason was a more simple one, that is accepting external pressures. For instance, what played an enormous role was the accession of two, ten new member states in 2004. The idea of the old member states was, I mean, if we don't agree on those immigration rules right now, before the 1st of May 2004, we get the interference of the ten other member states and heaven, what will they do? So we have to agree on a lot of things, even if we don't li like it, uh, because you never know what the ten new member states will do. I mean, they were very polite and silent, and they didn't really influence the debates very much after the accession in the first year, so the old member states continued to do the lawmaking and finish their program. And the third reason is the behavior of the national civil servants during the negotiations. During those negotiations, uh, and we have several PhDs, uh, researchers in, the, in, in our institute who are uh, studying this, what the national civil servants do is primarily trying to export their own, their own rules, because they all think that their own rules are the best. Of course, they are, they are the only rules that they know rules and that they are used with. And if they are not unable to export, which is a problem if you have 15 or 27 member states, you can't all export it in one uh, instrument, then you defend your national rules. So the attitude is defending uh, if you don't succeed in exporting your national rules to the European level. Uh, and second, the, the, the civil servants who negotiate were basically immigration law experts and not community law experts some in the German delegation, because it was a very wide delegation, there were some community law uh, experts. And I think generally the, uh, the national civil servants underestimated the effect of, of migration law having become community law. That there would be a court that would interpret the rules, that would use their old, uh, its, old, uh, uh, its old case law, and that they, those rules in the end will be followed uh, and implemented by, by uh, national uh, uh, judges. So they all came back uh, and said, uh, nothing, we, don't, we don't have to alter much in our national legislation. I think the, the head of the German, uh, the German delegation who negotiated on the family unification came back and wrote an article in the Zeitschrift für Ausländerrecht and said, there are three minor points where we have to change our national law. And I mean, this was a sign of how they had successfully negotiated. Uh, in fact, it took them a whole year to prepare uh, the changes in the, in the Dutch, in, in the German in, in immigration law. But the message was: I mean, we have succeeded because we have defended our national law, and underestimated what the effect is that it now is community law. Now, what are the the main effects of the new situation that the application of national uh, immigration law in the member states, in most cases? at least the euro, uh, is implementation or application of EC law, migration or, or asylum directives and regulations. And again, I look from the perspective of immigrants, often third country nationals. Now, the first advantage is that in those EC or instruments, there's far more often talk of rights of migrants rather than of discretion of immigration authorities, as is usually in the national immigration, uh, legisl uh, immigration, um, immigration legislation, where it's talk about powers of the immigration authorities rather than of rights of, of migrants. And these rights might be maybe material rights, the right to family reunification, the right to secure residence for long-term uh, residents, uh, the right to residence or prolonged residence for students or for uh, refugees, uh, or it might be a right to equal treatment, which is maybe as important as, as residence rights. Or those rights are procedural rights, which in the end may produce material rights. Uh, to give you some examples, 
the right to appeal against refusal at the border, which is in many member states not such, so natural that you have a right to appeal if a, a, a border guard says no, or the right to appeal uh, of a refusal of a visa. In not all member states there is uh, uh, a right to appeal against the refusal uh, of a visa, but in the border code and in the uh, visa code uh, this is uh, uh, integrated. The right to legal aid in asylum procedures is not uh, present in all, all member states, but it's in uh, the uh, asylum procedures directive with, with postponements for some uh, uh, member states. But uh, in the end, uh, it will be there. Uh, once the Lisbon Treaty gets uh, ratified, the EU Charter will become uh, uh, binding law, binding on the member states. And one of the provisions of the EU Charter is effective remedy against all decisions by national authorities, also in immigration cases. So the case law of Strasbourg that said our rules about fair procedures don't apply to immigration cases, and the European Convention rules, uh, Article 6 doesn't apply, is no longer important because under the EU Charter there will be a right to eff effective remedy, and for instance the question of whether suspensive effect whether remedies should have, in most cases, remedies should have suspensive effects, which is one of the very important aspects of immigration law, uh, becomes a matter of community law. So, more rights, less discretion. Second advantage from the perspective of third country nationals is the external control on the application of this new uh, EU migration law in the member states by the community institutions by the Commission, by the Court, and by the European Parliament. And the first example of this is the interesting uh, communication by the Commission of October last year on the way the Family Unification Directive has been applied in Member States, which is very critical on certain mentioned exactly Member States who, who by name, uh, on a range of points where they don't apply its... Uh, 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 and for instance, one of the examples, the Netherlands is there a champion in non-application, together with uh, Estonia, who never had a right to family reunification before the directive. And we are uh, the, the, the main culprits in, in that communication. One of the points where the Commission says, um, uh, your rule, your income re re requirement for family reunification, in the Netherlands there is 120%. You don't have to have 100% of the minimum income, but you have to have 120% which has a lot of negative effects uh, on family unification, they said this is not in uh, uh, conformity with, uh, commun with the family unification directive. Three months later, our state council, who is not very immigrant positive, I mean, felt compelled when they had to decide the same question to refer the question to Luxembourg. Because the commis commission had openly stated that this was uh, not in conformity with uh, the uh, community uh, uh, with community legislation. I mean, this is one of the central elements of the more restrictive uh, national family reunification policy in the Netherlands uh, in, in, in the last year, and it, it still is. And now, all, all of a sudden, this has become a matter of community law that is not decided in the Netherlands anymore, but will be decided in, in Luxembourg. So, external controls. To give another example, Italy, in the last few months, or few years, I should say, both its, the government policy towards Romanian citizens and the government's policy towards asylum seekers have been, has been criticized and, uh, and the subject of debate in many EU institutions and Italy no longer can answer. I mean, this is internal policy. I mean, why do you bother with us? Uh, which would have been the traditional answer. Uh, the, uh, so, external control on the application of this new law. The interpretation, I think that's the third point of those new instruments, by the court will be influenced by their case law on free movement, either because there is explicit uh, reference in the new documents, in the preambles, or uh, there's implicit residence, uh, reference to the, uh, uh, to the, uh, uh, the case law and the, the legal position of uh, EU nationals. Uh, it's the same, I think to a certain extent, the same will, will happen as happened with the interpretation of uh, uh, EC Turkey Council position 180, where the position of Turkish 
immigrants, Turkish migrant workers and their family members, has been related to that of uh, EU workers. It will also, this will also happen because I think it's the, 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 the basic perception of the Court of Justice of its task to bring coherence in community law. Uh, bring coherence in a, patch, a, a, a natural patchwork, because the whole EC migration law is a whole patchwork of, of separate uh, instruments negotiated on different uh, <coughs> moments. Uh, and also, it will be influenced with, about uh, their case law in other fields. I mean, how has, has misuse of community law or fraud been interpreted in other fields of community law? This will interpret, uh, influence the way the court will interpret uh, in this, this same concept in, in the new uh, directives. Fourthly, the general principles of community law will apply. And in the, its first case on the uh, Family Unification Directive uh, in, in 2006, six, the uh, court in the end of the judgment very explicitly refers to it. There in the, in the areas where the national authorities still are left in, the, in discretion, they have to take into account the, uh, the uh, uh, general principles of, of the community law. For instance, the proportionality principle. I mean, you can no longer, as an immigration uh, official, say you don't, uh, uh, the, you don't fulfill all the requirements of family unification or the long term or the student directive, and thus we refuse. No, you have to consider whether you your decision is uh, proportional. Uh, in the first uh, judgment of the court on the Dublin, uh, Dublin II regulation, reference to the principles of, of community law, and last week there was a judgment of the court in the case Sadin on the high fees uh, for uh, residence permits in the Netherlands, and again a reference to the principles of community law. Now the fifth advantage from the perspective of third country nationals is that EC law will function as a barrier or a break on the uh, emotional side of the political debate or, of, uh, or on immigration law. Often in the political debate there are questions for immediate change or, or of the legislation to, do, to solve a new problem or to introduce those new uh, 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 measures. In the trade, I read a document, new proposals for more restrictive uh, 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 measures uh, of uh, Dutch Family Unification uh, Directive. All admitted family members should have at least completed secondary education. Of course, that is not possible under the Family Unification Directive. And, uh, and <laughs> interestingly, the government has said, we'll ask an advisory board to advise us on the compatibility with international law and European law. It's already clear that this is impossible, um, and a, a lot of other things proposed. So it's a break on pol new political uh, restrictions. And lastly, as the sixth point, I think one of the important effects of the new EC immigration law is that it has blurred the binary distinction between EU nationals and third country nationals, because between us and them. Because the new law has created a, a, a whole range of intermediate statuses. Uh, some of third country nationals uh, have to be treated almost like us. They are not yet EU nationals, which is of course the, the, the top. Uh, but they have to be treated on the basis of community law almost like, uh, almost like us. And I have to confess that I, uh, uh, I had a fear that the, uh, uh, the community law would uh, stress the difference between third country nationals and EU nationals, and in fact, what happened over the last 10 years is just the opposite. Now, if we apply the two models of Motomura to the new EC migration law, we see examples of contract law, of the contract law, the contract law in the student uh, di directive, in the returns uh, uh, directive. But we also see examples of the future citizen uh, model. For instance, in the long-term residence directive, in the blue card uh, directive, if it's uh, ever uh, applied, and in the family unification uh, uh, directive. And I expect 
that there will be a gradually move from contract law to the future citizens model for most of the third country national citizens legally admitted in the EU. And moreover, as a result of migration law now being EC law, I foresee the further extension of the rule of law in an area of law, immigration law, dominated by discretion, bureaucratic power and, and politics. The law side of immigration law will be reinforced. Migration law at the national level is often exceptional law. Things happen in migration law that are considered and are considered in the, as normal in migration law that are unacceptable in other parts of administrative law or other fields of law. And also as a result of the EC law being uh, applied in, in, in this area, general notions of law will get more weight and equal treatment will become uh, the norm and different differences of treatment will have to be justified. So, more rule of law in this area. Now, this picture of the last 10 years, some of you uh, may say, uh, 10 years of lawmaking in Brussels it is, oh, is not only rosy. And I've, I started with one side, now the other side. And I will be a bit shorter uh, on this. I'll only mention five disadvantages from the perspective of immigrants uh, and their integration in, in uh, the societies of the member states. First, uh, in the proposal of the European Commission for those new instruments, generally there is far more attention for migrant rights and for human rights, uh, a tendency to look to international instruments and to what happens in, uh, in the free movement law on the same issues than during the negotiations in the council bodies. When the national civil servants start to negotiate on those proposals, this, the, the, the focus is completely different than uh, what uh, the, the focus uh, uh, of, on this point is in the Commission proposal. Secondly, you see that in, in many instruments, the level of rights or protection uh, is lowered, is reduced during the negotiations, and often reduced below the level in some in the national law in some member states. What also happens is that uh, EU rules, new EU rules, once they are agreed, are used as an excuse uh, or an argument uh, to uh, to restrict or to lower the national uh, level. I mean, now this is the European norm, so we should not be more favorable than the new European law. No. A third. A uh, disadvantage of, of negative effect is that the EC law forced some member states to do away with privileged treatment of certain groups of third country nationals. Certain groups of third country nationals. Spain, for instance, had to abolish it, the visa freedom for most of the South American countries, uh, or new uh, restrictions were introduced for citizens of the third countries just across the board, international visa obligation for Moroccan in, in Spain. And interestingly, see, you now see that the new member states, for instance Poland, is pressing within the Union to have a certain liberalization of uh, its border regime with Ukraine, both for economic reasons uh, uh, and for humanitarian reasons. And these are exactly the same reasons why Germany wanted to have Poland in. One of the Schengen treaties that is often forgot is the Schengen Treaty uh, of 1993, uh, where Germany forced the other uh, four Schengen states that didn't really want it to grant visa freedom to Polish nationals. Because Germany wanted to have a, a visa-free uh, traffic. That's exactly what Poland now wants with Ukraine. So you see the same pressure uh, uh, repeating, and, and I think there you see some of the elements of the magnet of the EU, that the bordering states always want to have the next one, uh, the, the next one uh, in. The fourth uh, disadvantage is uh, that the EU law 
has made it more difficult for certificate nationals to enter the EU in a legal way. The Schengen information system, uh, the carrier sanctions, uh, especially for asylum seekers, uh, makes it more difficult and this has made the price and the risks of illegal entry far higher and it sometimes even made it a deadly risk. And the fifth and last, last uh, development, uh, a negative development from the point of view of the internationals, is the development of large databases that uh, uh, were developed for migration control, but now, after some years, are all used for other purposes. Either they are used or they will be used for other purposes. And I'll be short on this issue because I'm sure other uh, uh, people will speak during this course. Basically, there are, at, at, uh, we uh, talk today about three uh, of those uh, large databases. There's the Schengen Information System that is already in place since uh, 1996, where there are now about 800,000 third country nationals registered for refusal at the border or for refusal uh, at the visa. Secondly, there's the Eurodoc, that is a, a system of uh, uh, where the fingerprints of asylum seekers are and of illegal uh, part of the illegal entrance in the EU are, are uh, stored. Uh, and there are now, I, I, I forgot to, to look up the exact number at home before I, I left, but hundreds of thousands, if not million, uh, finger, uh, field persons, uh, fingerprints are already in the Eurodac. And then there is, uh, under development, I mean the, 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 the law, the rules the, uh, have already been agreed, the visa information system, this, which will be a far bigger system because it will have data on all visa applications and also data on part of the sponsors of third internationals uh, who will be uh, uh, who, who applied for the visa. So it will not only contain data on third internationals but also data on union citizens and often data on EU citizens of migrant origin because the sponsors often tend to be uh, uh, original migrants uh, themselves. Now they have been developed <coughs> for immigration control purposes, but uh, they are now or will are or will be used for criminal justice and secret service purposes as well. You see a clear example of what's called function creep. You develop an instrument for one purpose and then all of a sudden, I mean, it's easy to use it for the other purpose. Uh, the new rule, the new generation of the, the Schengen Information System, SIS2, uh, there will be far more data, uh, also <coughs> geometric data of third country nationals in that system. There will be far more pol uh, police authorities and other secret service authorities uh, uh, who will have access. The number of uh, member states where uh, there will be access to that system uh, uh, expands uh, uh, greatly. Uh, and also police uh, authorities uh, will have, uh, 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 and criminal justice authorities will have adjust, uh, uh, access to the immigration law data, which is the large number of uh, persons in that system. Uh, this, this, once it will work, will, work, will also be uh, accessed for criminal law purposes. And last week, the Commission, uh, under heavy pressure of Germany, who originally proposed it, have now proposed an amended uh, Eurodac regulation which will allow for access of criminal law uh, authorities uh, to the fingerprinting system uh, of uh, Eurodac. Now in VIS, in the Visa Information System and Eurodac, data on all third country nationals concerned are included. There's no free choice. If you apply for a visa, you will be in the system. If you apply for asylum, you will be uh, in, in the system without any other negative uh, indications. Uh, and I see two risks. The first risk is that higher, there's a higher chance for those people in those data uh, bases uh, to be involved in, uh, in police uh, uh, measures than for the rest of the population that are not obliged to have their data uh, in the uh, database. Uh, and second is the, uh, the risk of stigmatization. Because if there's a bigger chance that you will, you're, you're, you will be uh, involved in criminal uh, 
uh, uh, law uh, activity because your your data are in a, in a large uh, uh, automated data database. The idea that immigrants are uh, more inclined to criminality will be reinforced. And I think it's spare, uh, uh, special worrisome because the experience with the Schengen information system is rather negative, both on the side of very little control on uh, external control by national data authorities, only in certain German landers there has been rather strict uh, control uh, on the Schengen information system, and there where there are reports about the quality of the data in, in uh, Schengen information system, these are very poor. A large part of the data are incorrect, people who should not be registered at all, like the uh, uh, refused asylum seekers uh, in Germany. Uh, and I think if you, if you see the, the recent case law of the court in Strasbourg, in the, the case of Marburg versus the UK, of the court in Luxembourg, in the Huber case, where it was on the use of uh, personal data of EU nationals for criminal and uh, justice and secret service purposes and a very critical uh, judgment. And you see the judgment of the Bundesverfassungsgericht. Uh, uh, I, I think lawmakers should think again about this uh, use and, and the lack of effective guarantees. Now, and and I, I think I'm very especially worried because this might have serious negative effects on, on the whole perception of immigrants in, in the host society. Now the final question, of course, is will the advantages outweigh the disadvantages? Is, this, is the picture uh, good or bad? Is the bottle half full or half empty? And I think it's not easy to answer. Because how are you going to compare the relevance or the importance of each of the positive or negative changes, the advantages or disadvantages from the perspective of nationals I, men I mentioned. And are you comparing them for one directive, or one regulation, or for the whole collection of, of more than 20 uh, new instruments? Are you comparing them for one member state or for all 27 member states? Even if you do this for one directive, I think it's, it's difficult to give a, 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 a clear answer. Uh, in our center we did uh, uh, a comparative study one year after the uh, implementation of the uh, Family Unification Directive and we clearly saw that in some member states there uh, was a reduction of the national standards. France was a very interesting uh, example because without ever referring to the Family Unification Directive they in the national legislation on six points reduced the rules to exactly above what was allowed uh, under the Family Reunification Directive. They never said that this was what they did, but so they, they completely complied with their obligations under the Family Reunification Law uh, rules uh, without ever uh, mentioning. But in a lot of other member states, there had never been a right to family reunification in national law. So having a, a directive, an EU directive, with granted the right to family reunification was uh, 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 a big advantage. Uh, and in the Netherlands, several restrictive rules in the national law have been already amended or, or come under debate because of the, the, uh, uh, the, the new uh, EC directive. And to, uh, to answer this question, uh, I may at the end uh, end with one other last personal experience. In, uh, uh, I'm chairman. Uh, as Peter mentioned in the beginning of the Mayor's Committee, and in that function, in, in spring 2003, I signed a letter to the European Commissioner Fratini uh, to ask him to withdraw the Family Unification Directive proposal because the way it had been amended by member states, in our view, it uh, on certain points allowed member states to go under the minimum uh, rules of Article uh, 8 of the European, European Convention of Human Rights. Now today, I'm very happy that the Commission did not follow our advice. I mean, they wrote a nice letter back and explained why they did, they, they did not withdraw the, the, uh, the, the, the directive. If I see how the, di how the directive now functions as a barrier to all kinds of recent uh, proposals, 
uh, I'm very happy that uh, it was uh, adopted even uh, in, in the status as, as, it, as it was. And so my opinion is, is that in the, in the long run the advantages will outweigh the disadvantages. But we could try to reduce the negative effects and try to promote, promote or support the positive ones. Thank you for your attention. Thanks so much, That's uh, Kudene. A, a tour de force of the, of the problem from the historical to the horizontal lay of the land to this uh, analysis of the analysis, uh, advantages and disadvantages. Really a very useful contribution. And now the floor is wide open to your, for your comments or questions. Uh, Richard. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Professor Kern Dyke, for this very interesting presentation. Um, I'm glad you liked the letter because probably I was the author of that letter. On the family reunification. So, I didn't uh, like it at that time. <laughs> no, maybe not, but now you do. Um, the whole framing of this uh, issue is really the rights of the state versus the rights of the individual. Um, it seems to me, and I think the, the tenor of your, of your presentation is in this direction, um, that is, the whole balance has been tilted towards the state. Uh, and the reason for that is very clear, because of the threat of, of terrorism, which, although terrorism itself is a terrible thing, um, can be exaggerated. And, you, and it has to be um, the, the, the rights of one versus the rights of the other. You as a lawyer, how do you see this um, being resolved, this, this whole issue of uh, the state versus the individual? That's a very general question. Uh, uh, if, if you uh, raise the point of terrorism and combating terrorism, I, I think uh, the, uh, the example of the common travel area between uh, uh, Britain and Ireland, I think Northern Ireland in Europe has been the place where there has been most of the terrorism before we all started to be worried uh, before the, 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 the 11th of September 2001. And there, I mean, those countries could, countries could cooperate uh, or, and, and, and try to have effective measures against uh, the terrorism there without having this whole system of databases and, and, and cooperation. Uh, and uh, I, I also uh, uh, think that uh, the, uh, there has been an, an interesting book written by my colleague uh, Elspeth Giles and um, uh, some other authors rather shortly after uh, 11 September on how uh, in EU migration law there was a reaction uh, of this and, and how the argument of uh, terrorism uh, uh, should force us to change all, all our rules and you see that maybe you, you again you wrote the, but the first reaction of the Commission was to calm down and say to the extent we need immigration measures, I mean, you can take them already on base of the uh, if, uh, of the existing document. You don't need other instruments to 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 effectively combat combat terrorism. Now, of course, now there is a whole union uh, in the uh, in the DG General who has an interest in continuing to to produce all kind of new uh, instruments and, and and databases to effectively combat terrorism. But I think. This is a very clear example of, of how community institutions, at least in the beginning, and I think in a, in a right way, react. And if you frame it as, in, as, as a, the dilemma between, uh, or, uh, between the right of the state versus the right of the individual, I think the lessons of the last 10 the effects of the last 10 years in the field of immigration will be a move from the right of the state to the right of the individual. Because in, in national immigration law, there was hardly ever any talk about the right of the individual. It was only the right of the state. So the fact that there now is a community law right to family unification, I think that's something different than a rather broad right to uh, family life, which never includes the right to family unification. Only in two cases so far the court has said it allows a first admission. Uh, I think there is a very basic move from the right of the state to the right of the, uh, of the individual. And of course, 
the, the, the programs of activities against terrorism will, will try to move back a bit in the, directive, in, the, in, the, in the direction of the right of state. But I doubt whether it will succeed. But I'm an optimist. Yeah. Um, I have one question um, regarding your five disadvantages for third country nationals. So one point you mentioned was that it's more difficult to legally enter the EU. And my question is first, to what are you comparing this? So it's more difficult than before compared to national law. And also what aspects are you referring to specifically? And also what are the consequences? I mean, you mentioned one that people might try to, 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 to enter illegally, but... Uh, what were you referring to, like specifically? Uh, I, 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 that's, that's a good question, and I, I think uh, uh, basically it's it's compared to uh, uh, national law before, because before the Treaty of Amsterdam, there was no community law on the admission of third country nationals, uh, except from from family members of EU migrants. So uh, there was. There was no community law, and it was only a question of, of uh, 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 of, of national law of, of the member states. Uh, I, I think the the uh, extension of uh, visa requirements, I mean, you, uh, you being uh, uh, the introduction of the the, the, the blacklist of of uh, a large part of the world where you have to have visa. Uh, uh, unless you are unable to, to enter uh, legal, legally and you'll, you'll not uh, get, get admission. So uh, I think the answer to your question is first uh, the, uh, uh, the comparison to the national law before and secondly uh, one of the examples is the extension of the visa uh, 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 policy which did away with a lot of uh, visa exemptions especially for countries uh, in, in, uh, in the, uh, not bordering the, the EU, just across the external border. The woman in the back there. Um, I'm speaking <coughs> with you with mine, uh, extending out the debate about system versus state to uh, debate which is quite common in the UK, which is that the debate about immigration uh, and the rights of the citizen are the rights of the citizen within a country to know that they are safe uh, and that there is some form of border and immigration control. Uh, you can probably tell from my accent where I'm from, and this is a very difficult place sometimes for us to manage uh, being out here and, and to be back to colleagues back in the UK. But it's not just the rights of the migrants, but the rights of the new citizen. Um, uh, uh, the, 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 the problem, is, of course, with this debate is that, that it's uh, partially a debate about reality and partially a debate about feelings. Uh, one of the interesting things is, if you look at the, the, uh, the statistics of uh, border control and the number of people refused entry in the Netherlands, across the German-Dutch border, which was the, the, the part from the airport, Schiphol, the only remaining uh, and, and the, the harbour in Rotterdam, the port in, in, in Rotterdam, but the only remaining land border, you see a clear reduction of the people refused uh, entry in, in the years before Schengen. So, uh, before uh, even the Treaty of Saarbrücken, the Treaty of Schengen was signed in, in 85, 84 and 85, there was a clear, I, I think all, it was reduced almost half of them. And of course this, this is not uh, uh, was not a reproduction of, uh, of a change in less uh, dangerous immigrants, but probably in a change less uh, immigration control, uh, less uh, border police. Now, one of the effects of Schengen in the first year after the, the 85 Schengen uh, agreement was uh, signed was a, 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 rise, a, rise, a rise of this, uh, this number because the border police still wanted to show that they had a function. Uh, and, and, and of course, th this was in many member states a, a serious problem with Schengen. I mean, what do you do with your border police if you abolish the, 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 uh, uh, the border controls at, the, at your land borders? In, in Germany, the solution was make a federal police out of them, which they 
after the Second World War, after the Nazi period, didn't want to have uh, for for clear reasons. In the Netherlands, I mean, the border police had to show that they still had that they had a function that we should have uh, a, 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 a border police. So I, I mentioned this example to see, I mean, whether it's the idea of. Uh, uh, we are in need of protection, and are we well protected or not? And this is to a large extent determined by the debate. I mean, what, how do uh, policymakers, uh, civil servants, and the press? I mean, what do they? Uh, how do they frame? How do they frame the, 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 the discussion? And far less to what is actually happening at the borders, and who are we stopping? And 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 who are the real? Dangerous. I mean, who are the real terrorists and are or the real uh, big criminals? And are we stopping them by immigration measures or uh, much more by focused police activities rather than those general uh, Im Im immigration uh, uh, controls? Uh, and my second remark is uh, uh, will, will be there's of course the citizens already in the state. There is the people coming in, but there is also the migrants living, lawfully living in the country. And there, I think, uh, the biggest change will be uh, reproduced by the, uh, by the new EC migration uh, law. I mean, that their position uh, will be determined to a large extent by the, the new rules, rather than by national rules uh, only. But of course, in the UK, that won't happen, and in Ireland, because they have opted out. Uh, of the main uh, documents in the instruments in the legal uh, 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 concerning legal migration, so that applies only in the uh, in the other United states. Okay. Um, with regard to your last question, to um, give the advantages uh, outweigh or are um, more important than the disadvantages. Um, of the communitarization of um, migration law. And you gave the example of the family reunification um, directive, which is, I think, very illustrative, because you have these advantages that it's protected us from more strict measure and disadvantage um, that it lowered down some standards. But isn't it always like this that you go to the lowest common denominator and you have other examples in the migration, European migration law, where um, Got the level up for some countries, and got the level down for other countries. Uh, yeah, I mean, that, I mean, that, that, that is one of the, the uh, I think, the big problems of community law generally, and also one of the attractive things of the community. I mean, that it's very hard to pinpoint who is losing and who is winning, because you're winning on one point uh, and losing on another po other point, uh, losing, winning in one directive, losing uh, with the other directive. Um, for instance. Uh, the long-term residence directive. Uh, we did some studies preparing the field for the commission in, in, in this area in, in, in Nijmegen. One of the uh, uh, effects I had never foreseen would that that directive was used in uh, some of the Baltic states and in Slovenia to deal with the problem of the stateless persons. In Slovenia, for instance, there was a large group of of uh, former uh, Yugoslav citizens with the wrong ethnicity, I mean, because they were not of Slovenian descent, and they were they after some years became stateless because they had no there was no Yugoslav nationality anymore, uh, and the, the government in the end used used the, uh, the long term residence law to to solve this problem and give those people a legal status, uh, which in the end will help them to uh, acquire, uh, uh, is their home, uh, um, uh, Slovenian nationality. Uh, so, uh, and, and uh, I, uh, I, I think you, you're right uh, that uh, at least during the negotiations you often see a lowering of the level uh, because all the member states want to defend their own systems, uh, and if, if member states don't have a special interest in opposing these wishes, they will give away to the, to the others. Uh, but in my last example, I, I mean, then you compare it all, all with a level at a certain time. 
but of course there is also the dynamics afterwards. I mean, why uh, am I now happy in, as a Dutch citizen that uh, we got a reply that uh, uh, you and they were wrote? Uh, because things have changed over the last six years in the Netherlands in a way I never imagined that was possible when we wrote that letter. Uh, so, uh, it, whether it's an advantage or a disadvantage, uh, or whether it's lower or higher, you should also compare in, in, in time. And of course that makes it uh, difficult to, uh, even more difficult to answer your question. There was one over here. Yeah. And then, um, Yes, I have a question about um, the blurring of the boundaries, you say, between third country nationals <coughs> and EU citizens. <coughs> I was wondering if it's not more of a theoretical blurring rather than a concrete one because I have the impression with the secretization of migration, which on a political discourse side, side um, tends to what they call othering, so the discourse of us and them, where them is not clearly defined because we don't know where the enemy is or who the enemy is. And on a more um, technological side, leads to where well, all the information systems we're talking about who we'll also have very dark side. Um, I, was, I was wondering this, this blur you, you were talking about because, well, third country nationals have more rights nowadays, almost as much as citizens. If it's not just theoretical in the sense that, well, it has led maybe to a kind of rarefaction of third country nationals who are actually treated as citizens. And so there's less third country nationals than this blurry, which would seem to, to to implicate that whoever from a third country will be treated uh, in a human way, etc. So, what are the prospects for a concrete blurring of these boundaries? Because I think that it's theoretical right now. Yeah. First, I did first I uh, about. Uh, you mentioned ex uh, concrete examples of cases where in Western Europe or in Europe generally foreigners were treated in the same way as citizens. Uh, I, I, I once wrote an article about quasi-citizens, uh, uh, non-citizens treated almost as citizens, but these were, and we did a study to find them in several EU member states, but these were very isolated and small groups, I mean, real cases where foreigners were treated as citizens in, in the 20th century, I, I, I want to know, uh, when the, 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 the Union citizenship was instituted in, in, in uh, 1982, I, I wrote an article where, where I expressed my fear that exactly what you were saying would happen, that we, I mean, at one hand, we would have the union citizens being us and them, the others, uh, of course, inferior uh, state, legal status and uh, in, inferior culture or uh, others. Uh, and, uh, and my other worry was that, that the union citizenship, because the uh, institution had been proposed by uh, uh, some southern member states and the northern member states, really didn't want to change anything and didn't want to give any rights. It was basically Spain that wanted to support its legal status of its citizens in, in the other member states, that that would be a hollow shell, not assisting anybody, and that it would kind of justify racial discrimination within the Union. I mean, having the idea of union citizenship and the rest. Now, what happened was that I was mistaken on both sides. I mean, the union citizenship really started to be uh, filled in and materialized by the case law of the court in the, in the last 15 years. And on the other hand, you see that there, there are a whole range of third internationals the, uh, um, who get rights that are almost similar. I mean, for instance, the Turkish workers and their family members is one quarter of all third, third internationals in the, uh, in the Union. Uh, under community law, they have almost the same rights as community workers. Uh, the long-term residents, in a, in, I mean, it's part of the opposition of the United States against applying that uh, the, the directive, but they get almost the same rights as, as, as unions. It's not the political rights, of course, there are still differences. So it's far less them 
and us or us and them, but there are all kinds of, of, of in-betweens. And, and so the, my fear that, that this distinction between union citizens and third country nationals would kind of uh, be a kind of even unintentionally uh, justification for difference in treatment and, and racial discrimination, I, I think that has been unintendedly, maybe also uh, quite effectively uh, opposed by what happens in the European legislation. Exporting our rules, or does it mean uh, paying for border control uh, instruments and techniques in Morocco and Mauritania? Uh, it would be dealing with the migratory flow at all the stages of the flow, so from origin up to arrival in the uh, Union, in cooperation with their countries. Uh, yeah. And that implies border control, migration <coughs> control. Capacity building to deal with asylum issues, etc. Yeah, I, I, I don't believe in any of it. Uh, I, I, I don't believe in anything. I mean, if you see the, the as far as uh, labor migration, I mean, one of the, the, the essential issues, I mean, what, what did we open? We, we paid IOM to open one office in Bumaco that is supposed to, to, to tell people. Uh, not to come to uh, not to come to Europe. Uh, uh, I think that that way uh, 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 might even be more counterproductive. I think where there will be where it will work is uh, not where we intendedly uh, export it, but the unintended effects. I, I think the case law of the court of Luxembourg or the asylum directors will have influence outside the EU because it is translated in 21 languages uh, and people all over the world can read it and it's the the, uh, the first international court that will uh, uh, in an indirect way interpret and apply the refugee convention there i believe in but the idea that we can influence um, migration movements uh, yeah maybe just at the, at, at the external border. I mean, what we are doing now in controlling the territorial waters or of northern, so northern African countries. There we have some concrete. We can move migration uh, uh, movements from one place to another. But the idea that we can uh, stimulate uh, men, uh, uh, third countries to do it the way that pleases us. Uh, I don't know whether you have read the bilateral agreements uh, that, are, that are signed with uh, between Spain and some of the West African countries. Uh, if you compare them by the, with the recruitment countries that the, the northern uh, European countries concluded with the, the former recruitment countries uh, that are now member states, I mean, these, that, that are holy uh, texts and, and those other documents aren't worth the paper there. Um, and, and uh, I, I think they are only signed by those governments because they bring financial advantages for the, their leaders rather than they change anything in, in, in the field of migration uh, at all. So I'm very negative, very skeptical about that. Is there even Lucia What extent do you think Shane is an example of what we now term enhanced cooperation and how will cooperation lend itself within the Lisbon Treaty and the Iraqis to the problems of immigration? Uh, that's a, that's, a, that's a, uh, a good question. Uh, I, I, I think 
uh, the member states have learned from the Schengen experience that, that having a complicated uh, cooperation outside uh, the uh, uh, framework of the Union uh, is not uh, uh, I mean, is not viable. And the other, in the area of migration, the all, all, only other, it was only indirectly or migration. Uh, it was more in, in police and criminal cooperation, the Prune Treaty. Uh, I think it's a good example where uh, uh, a few member states started, with basically Germany and its neighbors, and, and at a very late stage, Germany invited others that, that uh, uh, were a bit uh, annoyed that they weren't originally asked to cooperate from the beginning. But from the very beginning, it was uh, meant to be integrated with community law. So it was more or less, uh, rather than staging a whole new organization, it was stay, uh, having negotiations on concrete text with a, among a, a small group and then present the others with a feta complete. Uh, uh, and that, I think, will happen, uh, will happen in, in, in the future, either in a specialized treaty or uh, under the Lisbon Treaty, where there is a, a new initiative for member states. I mean, now, since 2004, the member states don't have the initiative. They will get it in this area in a, in a new way under the Lisbon Treaty. So I think you will more have these kind of commonly negotiated proposals by a few member states, rather than the uh, an, an organization outside the, the EC. And especially because there are now rules uh, on uh, enhanced cooperation. So if member states want to have more than uh, negotiating on a few rules, uh, or negotiating on new rules among a few with a few member states among themselves, they can do this within the union. They don't no longer have to do it as they did in Schengen outside the union. So I think uh, having rules on enhanced cooperation, although I, I don't see that they will be of, very often used, uh, and. Uh, are more or less a guarantee against being, making it less attractive to have a new kind of Schengen experience. But I think uh, just one more, and then we'll, we don't want to abuse our guests here. Please. Uh, you said that the, the, the borders are being blurred at the moment between us and them, citizen and non-citizen. And earlier on you said that there's a move from the contract model towards the future citizen model. Do you think this would lead us eventually towards having a directive on national acquisition and naturalization member states, or that's too much to ask? Uh, a good question. I, I expected this question, but I decided not to deal with it in my, in my introduction. I, I think uh, uh, it, it's very clear that the Union doesn't have the competence of lawmaking with regard to nationality. That said, there are two uh, developments. First, uh, you, you see that free movement rules will affect uh, the discretion of member states uh, in, with regard to the acquisition and loss of, of uh, member states. I mean, the case now pending before the court in Luxembourg or, or the Australian, uh, the Austrian citizen who moved to uh, Germany uh, acquired German nationality uh, on the basis of false documents uh, and now uh, Germany wants to uh, take away his German nationality but then he's no longer a union citizen anymore because he lost his Austrian nationality. Now is this this loss of nationality in conformity with uh, community law? And we'll get more and more of these issues and we'll get more and more issues also of, of the effects of um, the rules of acquisition of nationality. I mean, the, the, the uh, uh, Romanian legislation granting uh, 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 its nationality to uh, uh, descendants of former uh, Romanian citizens who are now Moldovian citizens, so just outside the Union. And the example I mentioned of the Italian, the hundreds of thousands of Italian nationals living in Southern America. This will will be more and more, more and more race uh, issues and there I think the, the path, the way will be more uh, there is a, a jargon term for it that, that I now have forgotten the kind of informal consultations I mean the way the Nordic, the Nordic Union they have very little binding rules, very little conventions uh, and agreements and treaties but they sat together and they agreed 
this, this is a wise rule, and then they all introduced it in the national uh, legislation uh, in, 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 within the Nordic state. I think this kind of uh, consultation, I mean, we have a common problem, uh, we have different national uh, legislation, how are we going to solve it? So, rather than having binding rules, directing, well, because simply there's no competence for the, the member states, I think in the end uh, uh, we uh, will have that. But it will take some time. Uh, I, I remember that under the last president, the last time the Dutch had the presidency, I was asked to comment on what kind of issues the Dutch president should, uh, she should uh, forward. And I mentioned this, this issue you raised. I mean, they looked at me and said, oh, it's an academic. I mean, <laughs> this, is, well, this is not a real problem. So I think the problem will come up shortly. Sure. Well, I'm reassured to know that, um, that the solution for the, the ills of the European Union is to become more like the Nordic uh, yeah. countries. Let me draw your attention before you close to the, um, the program for next week which is exactly on the internal and external uh, blurring of the borders relative to the challenge of migration. And we have Didier Bigot from uh, Sciences Po and King's College and Angela Liberatori from the uh, European Commission. So it promises to be a very good uh, event. Then it just remains to say thank you once again to Professor Kuruminde uh, and uh, thank you all for your questions.